Good morning. The District Court of Appeal of the State of Florida in and for the Second District is now in session. The Honorable Morris Silberman, Judge presiding. Those having business before this court, draw near, give attention, and you will be heard. May God save the United States of America, the State of Florida, and this Honorable Court. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session of the Second District Court of Appeals uh, remote oral argument. We have three cases on the oral argument docket, and they will be called in the order listed on the docket. When each case is called, there will be a brief pause as the presenters are transitioned into the virtual courtroom. After each case is completed, the participants will need to exit the courtroom by clicking on the leave button. Uh, and of course, they may continue to watch the oral arguments online if they wish to do so. We have, uh, it looks like, two presenters in each case. So as a reminder, oral arguments are 20 minutes per side. If you are the appellant and would like to reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal time, let me know and I will keep track of the time and let, let you know when you get to the uh, end of your first 15 minutes, if you wish to reserve the five or whatever amount that you reserve. Unmute your microphone when you are recognized to present your argument. I'm happy to be joined today by judges LaBritt and uh, LaRose. With that, we are ready to proceed. So the first case, Pacalinas versus Bleakley Bayville. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mr. Is it Pacalinas? Am I pronouncing it correctly? Pacalinas. Pacalinas. Thank you, Mr. Pacalinas. Let's wait for uh, opposing counsel. There we go. Mr. Irvin has come into the courtroom. So you may proceed with your argument and let me know if you wish to reserve some rebuttal time. Yes, I would like to reserve uh, five minutes for rebuttal, please. Very good. Uh, may, I, may it please the court. And uh, again, my name is Gedminas Pacalinas and I'm a appealant in this matter, um, thank you. And uh, I, re I respectfully request that the court review this appeal on a de novo basis. Uh, the questions are presented here and we are examining three issues raised in the initial brief. Uh, issue number one is whether the lower court incorrectly denied the appealant's motion to dismiss in proper venue when there was no established debtor and federal relationship the agreement was silent as to place of payment and the debt, if any, was unliquidated. Issue number two is whether the trial court improperly determined that the venue for this matter lies in Hillsborough County because the plaintiff failed to carry its uh, burden with competent substantial evidence. And issue number three is whether the trial court made a fundamental error and violated appealant's due process rights when canceling the motion to dismiss improper venue hearing and ruled on the motion without giving a reasonable opportunity to be heard. I have presented numerous Florida case laws in this appeal matter, and I believe this appeal has a good legal basis. Uh, to support my legal position, I provided as many case laws as I could uh, discover, and I would like to bring uh, this honorable court's attention to a few categories of the legal arguments that I provided, which in my opinion, uh, group the case laws by topic. Number one, uh, attorney fees are not liquidated damages. Uh, number two, the place of payment rule is not applicable. And number three, when there is no liquidated debt, the court looks at the allegations in the complaint to determine where the cause of action accrued and where the venue lies. Number four, once the authorized affidavit to reboot the appellee's venue selection was presented, the burden then switched to appellee. And number five uh, is due process. Uh, uh, number one, attorney fees are not liquidated damages. In this situation, under the circumstances, we are not dealing with a liquidated amount. Attorney fees are not considered liquidated damages, as cited in McDonald uh, and uh, Bauman, uh, B-O-W-M-A-N. Mr. Bauman, let, let me ask you a question, because I think the cases that you have referred to deal with a request for attorney's fees as an award against a party. This case, and I understand your argument, you're saying, well, they're claiming attorney's fees, but what they're, as I read the case, what they are claiming are damages for breach of contract, 
which happen to be for services rendered, and those services are attorney effort. So I'm not certain the cases that you have cited actually are supportive of the argument that you're making that this is not a liquidated sum. And I have uh, two more cases, uh, 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 Parker 1445 Wash, LTD case laws. Um, um, so you have uh, two more. And um, if, uh, if there are an attorney fee suit, it is a longstanding legal principle that it is a trial question that requires an evidentiary hearing with a testimony from both the attorney who per performed the services and as well as an expert uh, to determine a reasonable uh, amount. Uh, and I would like to refer the court to several authorities, Snow versus Harlan Bakeries Incorporated, where it says that such a requirement exists because attorneys have an ethical duty to charge fair and reasonable fees regard regardless of the terms of the fee agreement. What the co this complaint alleges, the complaint, uh, as you can see in appendix uh, number one, spe specifically claims that the appealant has unsettled debt to appellee in, in the amount of $97,668 plus interest and pre-judgment and post-judgment interest. The complaint further alleges that this is an action for damages based upon an open account. Um, a legal term based on uh, US legal dictionary that I uh, checked, uh, open, open account means uh, only an account in which the balance has not been determined. Um, and um, uh, just one, I would like to add that the bill uh, was objected. The amount is speculative, uh, speculative, sorry about my uh, Lithuanian accent. Um, and in, um, in case law, Hartford Fire in Insurance uh, CO versus Control Tech Incorporated, the court rejected the assertion that damages were liquidated simply because a fixed sum was demanded by the complaint. Uh, uh, please refer to uh, RJG Environmental Inc. versus State Farm Insurance, um, as well as um, another case law, Cost Law versus Sanders. Uh, and another uh, case law, Department of Transportation versus Cone, C-O-N-E, and Graham Incorporated. And damages are considered unliquidated when there's no sum certain as to the damages. And evidence and accounting must be presented to determine the exact debt that is owed. The complaint is also not sworn, and is, the billing is not authorized, and, and it's not notarized. And now we may uh, move uh, to the place of payment a rule known as the Crocker Rule from uh, 1934. Uh, so my second legal argument in this is that the place of payment rule does not apply because it only applies where the damages sought are liquidated. In this case, the appellee, Mr. Denman, uh, seeks unliquidated uh, amount which eliminates application of this rule. Uh, Patterson versus Teague, uh, T-E-A-G-U-E, uh, uh, Finn Group Incorporated from uh, 2nd DC 2014. And this uh, 2nd DC ruling in, in the case supports my legal argument. Uh, in this decision, the court, as well as I, in my briefs, referred to Cost Love versus Sanders uh, from Florida the District Court of Appeals 2009. Um, and, the, um, and it says, holding that where there is no liquidated debt involved, the place of payment uh, venue rule do not, rules do not apply. And the court must look to the allegations of the complaint to determine where the cause of action accrued and where the venue lies. Uh, although uh, at the lead, Mr. Denman claims in his answer brief that he's seeking liquidated damages because the damages can be calculated using simple arithmetic methods, this is fundamentally wrong legal application. Moreover, uh, this so-called invoice is actually an attorney lock sheet that has not been verified, uh, was not notarized, nor authorized or witnessed. Uh, and uh, my third legal argument um, is when there is no liquidated debt, the court looks at the allegations in the complaint to determine where the cause of action accrued and where the venue lies. There are four asserted causes of action in this case, breach of contract, open account, unjust enrichment, uh, and fraud. All of this provides no proper basis for venue in Hillsborough County. In terms of breach of contract, I want to point out that the engagement letter makes no provision of, uh, for a venue. 
according to the case law, sometimes where damages sought are not liquidated, the courts look to performance of cure. Um, American International Food Corp versus Lesco, uh, same in, uh, is in Department of Transportation versus Cone, C-O-N-E and Graham Incorporated. The judgment of the trial court was reversed and the matter was remanded with directions that the trial court transfer the venue to the county where the performance occurred. If the claim is for failure to perform under a contract and the performance was to take place elsewhere, the place of payment rule does not apply. And uh, uh, your honor, my fourth argument is the authorized affidavit to reboot the police venue selection was presented. Um, the burden then switched to the appellee, uh, Mr. Denman. Please refer to Rochta, uh, B-R-C-O-C-H-O-T-A, uh, Corp versus Kelly, uh, A-M, uh, Insurance uh, Corp versus Gohagen, G-O-H-E-A-G-A-N. Um, um, uh, CLs, please also refer to uh, residential uh, uh, mortgage incorporated versus Keysling. Um, Florida case law in such situation is clear that once a defendant challenges venue with an affidavit uh, con controverting the plaintiff's venue selection, the burden is on the plaintiff to prove that the selection of venue is proper. Please refer to Thule versus Thule and Sunco's Home Improvements um, Incorporated versus Robbie Child. Um, at the, at the lead, Mr. Denman did not file any response. Trial court must resolve any factual disputes and then determine whether the venue selection is legally supportable. Uh, so please refer to Price Waterhouse Coopers LLP versus Setter uh, C E D A R Resources Incorporated from uh, Second DCA. Um, uh, uh, 1999. And uh, please also refer to RJG Environmental Incorporation versus State Farm from uh, Florida 2nd DCA 2011. And uh, questions of facts, of facts such as venue must be resolved with an evidentiary hearing, please. Um, please refer to uh, Leatherwood versus Card Service International from Florida District Court of Appeals 2004. Uh, now we'll move on uh, to the last argument uh, in which I will argue for violations of due process. Uh, in this case, uh, Honorable Judge Huey erred when is issuing an order denying appealant's motion to dismiss uh, two business days before the scheduled evidentiary hearing was uh, canceled and violated uh, Florida Statute 61.511 in parentheses two fundamental rights uh, procedural due process. Uh, 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 please refer to Sims versus Holloway uh, for the District Court of Appeals 2013. The trial court decision was reversed because Sims was deprived of due process of law when the trial court entered the order without affording Sims uh, the opportunity to be heard on the motion to change venue. Under the uh, constitutional guarantee of the due process of the 14th Amendment, the right to be heard includes the right to introduce evidence at a meaningful time in a meaningful manner. Appeal was prevented from this opportunity. The violation of litigants' uh, due process rights requires reversal. And my conclusion um, is that the trial court abused its discretion and erred in denying the motion to dismiss improper venue pursuant to section 47.122 Florida statute uh, 47.011, uh, Florida statute uh, 61.511 in parentheses two, uh, fundamental rights um, and procedural due process. Therefore, um, um, I'm asking, uh, uh, honorably uh, that the trial court's order on, a, on, on appealant's motion to dismiss improper venue be overturned with instructions to grant appealant's motion and to grant such and any other re relief as may be appropriate under the circumstances. Thank you very much. Very good, thank you. And I will uh, give you your five minutes for rebuttal after we hear from Mr. Irvin. Mr. Irvin, you may proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my client is Blakely, Babel, Dimon, and Grace. I'm going to refer to them as BBDG in my uh, response. Uh, Your Honor, you alluded to a very important distinction in the case law cited by the appellant, and that is we're not seeking an unspecified amount of damages. We're seeking uh, an amount of damages for services rendered. 
And contrary to defendant's argument, this suit is for a collection of debt, not for a breach of services rendered. And the promise and the retainer agreement sued upon is for the promise payment of money. In fact, the only duty that appellant allegedly breached is for non-payment of money. The complaint alleges that BBDG's principal place of business is Hillsborough County. The complaint also alleges that venue is proper in Hillsborough County, Florida, because payment for legal services described therein was to occur at BBDG. That's that paragraph three of the complaint. Uh, the complaint seeks damages in the amount of $97,668.15 and outstanding costs of $690. The complaint also seeks attorney's fees and interest. However, as we, as we pointed out in the brief, uh, attorney's fees are litigation costs, and I believe uh, the appellant also recognized that as well. Uh, as he cited to uh, the Higley case. And uh, the case that we cited to for the proposition that attorney's fees or litigation cost is uh, Bidden versus Department of Professional Regulation, Florida Real Estate Commission, 596 Southern 2nd, 4, 450. That's a, that's a Florida Supreme Court case uh, where it says, in general, actual or compensatory damages are not identified as including attorney's fees, except when pled as special damages. And what this case really comes down to is the difference between a breach of duty to perform versus a breach of duty to pay the amounts due. If the court finds that this case is for the latter, the duty to pay the amounts due, then venue is proper in Hillsborough County because payment was due at the uh, BB and DG, BBDG in Hillsborough County. There is no other offices in Florida. The only offices is, is in Hillsborough County. Now, the appellant uh, cites to Coslow versus Sanders for Southern 3rd, 30, uh, 37, uh, where it says the court found the only duty Coslow had under the party's agreement was to handle all administrative forms and related details for sales made by Sanders and his representatives at no charge to Sanders. The complaint generally alleged that Coslow breached its duty. That is a duty to perform services under the agreement. The allegations were therefore considered a breach of performance and not for breach of payments for money's owed. Here, the only duty that appellant had was to make payment. That duty was breached. The cause of action accrued in Hillsborough County, and that's where payments was to occur. Even if the court finds that payment, the payment venue rule does not apply, the result is still the same. Because when if the rule does not apply, as appellant correctly pointed out, the court must look at the allegations and the complaint to determine where venue lies. And both uh, appellee and appellant cited Morales, Sand and Soil, LLC versus Kendall Properties and Investment. That's 923 Southern 2nd, 1229, uh, where the fourth DCA says that you got to look at the complaint and determine where venue lies. <clears throat> and when you look at the complaint, it's clear that at paragraph five, it says that venue is proper in Hillsborough County. So the right to initially select venues belongs to the pellet, to the, pla to the plaintiff. Uh, that's Gulfstream Seafood, 830 Southern 2nd, 908. Uh, that's a, a Florida 2nd DCA case. Uh, for the plaintiff's venue selection is presumptively correct. It's the defendant's burden, and this is contrary to what Eppley uh, pointed, the appellant pointed out earlier, is that the defendant's burden to plead and prove that venue is proper. In doing so, the, defendant, the defendant must provide a sufficient basis to overcome plaintiff's presumptually correct venue selection. Merely establishing that venue is proper elsewhere is not enough. Rather, the defendant has a burden to clearly prove that the venue selected by the plaintiff is proper. And it's only when the, the defendant provides sufficient factual basis 
does the burden switch back to the plaintiff to prove that its initial venue selection is correct. So it's our position that the defendant never presented adequate or sufficient factual base, basis establishing that venue was proper somewhere else. In his affidavit, he says that uh, he made payment from Pinellas County, but he never says where he made payment to. Um, that's because payment can only be made in one place. That's in Hillsborough County where BBDG is located. So the issue is very simple and it's our position is very simple. If the court finds that the duty to pay the amount due is what is sued upon here, then the payment venue rule applies and it is applied that the venue is proper in Hillsborough County. And even if it doesn't apply, then the, if the court looks at the allegations of the complaint, it's clear that venue is properly alleged in Hillsborough County. Now, as to appellant's argument that he wasn't afforded due process when Judge Huey uh, summarily uh, denied his, his motion without uh, a hearing, uh, if you look at the cases cited in the, in the brief, that, in the answer brief, it's clear that not all situations require a hearing. And especially here, when the burden has not been met, that is he has not provided a legally uh, supportive basis uh, to establish venue other than where we pled in our complaint, then the burden never switched. If the burden never switched, then the, the motion can be dismissed by the, by the lower court. So we believe that uh, Judge Huey's ruling was correct. We would ask the court to affirm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Irvin. Mr. Pacalinas, you have your five minutes for rebuttal. Don't forget to take off your mute. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, it is not true uh, regarding a non-payment. I paid over, uh, I spent over 61,000 for approximately five months uh, to attorney Denman and his experts transcript, uh, over $61,000 approximately uh, uh, five months. And um, so, and I, I added that in my affidavit, um, that information. And um, I would like to know that in my reply brief, uh, I, I said, and I showed uh, bank statements and record that uh, I paid, I was to send the money uh, first payment to Alabama. Doton, Alabama. So uh, there is evidence uh, exhibit in my re reply brief, uh, which shows that the money went to Alabama. And um, again, um, uh, so uh, da, 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 da. Uh, again, I believe did not present my evidence uh, uh, against billing. Uh, and billing was objected, um, as I uh, uh, said in my affidavit, um, as well as we can see in the appendix uh, for uh, initial brief. Uh, uh, moreover, as we have related case, uh, Denman versus the state of Genita Dirce, uh, Mr. Denman sued them for the same amount and billing. Um, uh, uh, so, And, and I think uh, we, uh, I'm confident we have here uh, clear due process violations. So the attorney log sheet is not liquidated um, and it's not, uh, it's not uh, authorized and it's not notarized. Um, so, um, so the attorney sh uh, sheet um, is not legitimate in my opinion. Um, and um, uh, Abdu, uh, I would like to refer your honor to um, uh, case law, Abdul Hassan case where the law firm sued its client. Uh, client was appealant and matter uh, was granted in favor of the appealant transferring matter in his client's favor to his residence and where the attorney services were received. Uh, here in this case, 
Um, and we also had a law firm suing the client. Attorney's fees in the second DC case was uh, considered not liquidated. And this is very similar lawsuit to the one that we are in today. There is no liquidated debt, and the appellee did not provide any proof of evidence. The complaint is unsworn, and the billing requires evidentiary hearing. Please, it is alleg uh, allegation for non-payment is just allegation. As I presented the evidence with my payments and my receipts, uh, I paid over sixty-one thousand dollars for uh, approximately five months. Um, as well as I presented that I was advised not to pay in full. The bill was objected and it's not reasonable. We have a police suing the state of Genita Derse relating the case for the same attorney uh, work performed. If you look at the billing attached to the complaint, it says guardianship of Genita Derse. It is, uh, 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 your honor, uh, accounting is necessary. Uh, uh, please. And um, as I said in, uh, previously, the amount is not liquidated. Um, uh, and uh, please refer to that Abdul Hassan case where we have, where we also have law from sue the client. And, um, and, uh, uh, and clearly, uh, Honorable Judge Huey violated uh, due process. Uh, so this is, uh, this is, I think that's all I have to say. Sorry, I'm uh, trying to get organized. Or, You're fine, Mr. Parklandis. You have about uh, 30 seconds left. Okay. Uh, so, uh, 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 Honorable Judge Huey canceled the hearing and not allowed to have an evidentiary hearing where I was able to submit uh, evidence, records, and important evidence. And uh, this right was uh, violated. Um, I didn't have a chance to submit a, a important evidence that I had. It was like hours, two business days, the hearing was canceled. And I put that information... Mr. Pakalini, my affidavit. Mr. Pakalini, that Thank you, Your Honor. That brings us to the end of the time, Mr. Pakalini. Uh, I will compliment you as a uh, pro se litigant. The cases and the briefing that you provided were very helpful, and Mr. Irvin, of course, yours as well. Thank you both, and you may exit the courtroom. The next case is Parisi versus Caviola. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. And don't forget there. to uh, hit the leave button. Very good. Mr. Upson and Ms. Hall, I see both of you in our virtual courtroom. Ms. Hall, you may proceed. Don't forget to let me know if you wish to reserve rebuttal time. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. I'm Sarah Hall of Ratzel and Andrus, and I represent the appellant, defendant Elizabeth Parisi. I would like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Very good. There, Parisi appeals from two trial court orders, so there are two issues on appeal. The first order is a June 7th, 2021 denial of Parisi's motion to disqualify the trial court. The second order and second issue is a February 5th, 2021 trial court order granting plaintiff Caviola's motion for entry of default final judgment, where there was no notice to Parisi from Caviola's counsel, the clerk, or otherwise. So the two main questions are whether the trial court erred in denying Parisi's legally sufficient verified motion to disqualify the trial judge, and whether the trial court erred when it entered an order granting plaintiff Caviola's motion for entry of default final judgment without notice and where there were two undisposed pending motions, the determination of either or both of those motions would have affected the party's rights to proceed with the litigation. And so disposition ruling upon them would have been required prior to entering a default final judgment. Briefly, the facts of the case that are relevant are that Caviola, the plaintiff below, served my elderly client, defendant Parisi, with this lawsuit, the instant lawsuit. 
at the time of the service. Ms. Hall, Ms. Hall, we've read the briefs and are familiar with the record. Let's talk about your contention that the trial court erred in entering the final judgment. That you, as I understand your arguments, you claim that the trial court was, the error is that the trial court should have ruled on the pending motion you had filed to vacate the non-final order that you later sort of converted to a motion to be, to set aside the clerk's default and that the trial court violated rule 1.500B by entering the default without notice to the defendant. And my questions to you about those two points are, didn't the trial court effectively rule on your motion that was directed to either the non-final order or the clerk's default? And two, 1.500B applied to the clerk's default, not to the, the court's entry of final judgment. That's the text of the rule. So at the time that clerk's default was entered, you had affirmatively rejected a request to accept service and indicated that you weren't representing the defendant. So those are my two questions about your points to the merits of the orders on appeal. Um, as I understand it, your first question was, didn't the court effectively rule on the motion to vacate? Yes, uh, because he not. told you, I've, uh, the effect of my non-final order is that it is a final judgment. I just need to sign the, the final form. So I've already made that decision, I'm telling you. And therefore, what you should do is wait for me to sign it and you can bring a 1.540B motion directed to it. How much more did he have to do to make clear that he had disposed of your motion? I, I would disagree that there was a ruling on the merits of the motions. The issue and what has continued to be an issue is what your honor has raised, that the court at some point at one hearing, and I, I believe it was the June 1st hearing, the court indicated that, well, my order granting was effectively a final judgment, that you know, if, if Caviola's counsel had submitted the default uh, judgment, I would have signed it. However, for whatever reason, counsel did not. However, at the prior hearing that was continued, so there, were, there was no ruling, the court said, this is just an order. This has no effect, despite the fact that the order has granted affirmative relief. So Parisi has been left in quite the quandary of, well, is this order granting Something that grants well, well, Let's talk about that quandary because within days of the June hearing, the trial judge did enter a final judgment. And at that moment, it, the transcript makes pretty plain that the judge had all but given you legal advice on what to do about that final judgment when it was entered. It, wouldn't you be in a much better posture if you had brought a 1.540 motion to vacate the final judgment? We had at that point, Your Honor, pending two separate motions. And because of the different conversations back and forth during the two, mo the two hearings, excuse me, it was unclear whether the order granting had the effect of a judgment or if it did not. So the first motion to vacate was filed based on the facts as understood at that point. And then the hearing was set. The judge wouldn't hear the merits of it, but said to the counsel, go back and discuss. And then once there was the continued attempt to resolve and figure out exactly what the effect of the order was, then there was the larger motion that was filed, which was, it made clear that it's unclear what's going on with the order granting, whether it has the effect of a default. So if it is a final judgment, here's the basis, then there was no notice. Well, then let's talk about then your, the motion and you filed a couple of them. If whether you cast it as a motion to set aside the clerk's default or a motion to vacate the non-final order, under either of those constructs, you had a burden to show excusable neglect, surprise and advertence, you agree. Yes. What evidence, what record evidence, as opposed to attestations of counsel? Is there an affidavit in here? Is there a verified pleading that is record evidence of excusable neglect? 
there is a verified pleading. The motion to the verified motion to disqualify the judge, Parisi herself outlines the situation with the confusion but and the other that's, that's not your motion to that that motion to disqualify the judge was directed solely to disqualifying the judge. It is still an affidavit and verified well testimony of Parisi. And after filing the motion to vacate the second motion, which I believe was filed June 4th or June 3rd, it was sometime in June of 2021. Requests were immediately made for an evidentiary hearing with the judge, which went unanswered. Where's the record on that? I was looking for where that request for evidentiary hearing showed up in this Unfortunately, record. the procedure that's employed in this case, and this in Lee County overall, is to request a hearing by letter. So it's not in the docket. It is simply a letter that's sent to the court that was never... But what, what record evidence do we have besides your representation? Other than there is not an evidentiary hearing, I am unaware, as I said here today, if there is any record evidence. Suffice to say that is the procedure or was the procedure, I do believe it's changed in Lee County, was to send a letter to the court requesting hearing time. And it did go unanswered. Ms. Hall, I'm gonna go back to something you said a few moments ago and you said in your brief. Am I understanding correctly that your view was the order entered by the court on February 5th of 2021. Your view is that was a final judgment? The order granting the motion for entry of default has the language that would seem required in a final judgment. It grants affirmative relief. And so- Does it, does it, award, that, does it award the damages that are requested? There were not damages awarded. Wasn't that the basis of the complaint? The basis of the complaint was to ask for, I believe, the partition of the house. And if I could pull up the order, I could make, yes. I could refer to it specifically if I may have one moment. It's at record 58. It is at record 58. So the Order granting plaintiff's motion for entry of default final judgment grants the request for specific performance and accounting. So that is the, the relief that was requested by plaintiff and it is granted in that order granted. But the, the order also says final judgment will be entered by separate order. I agree that it says that. However, granting the granting of affirmative relief in this order does seem to have all of the operative language for a final judgment. And it does, and the court did indicate in the June 1st hearing that this in effect has no different operation because all he would need to do, which he had already decided to do at that point, was to sign an order or to sign a final judgment. Where, so, where in that order does it direct your client to execute a deed? I do not believe it does, Your Honor. However, isn't that, it does isn't that what count? Well, hang on, isn't that what count one asks for? Specific performance, including requiring that a deed be executed conveying an undivided one half interest. It does. However, this order granting does grant the relief requested, which is the specific performance. How does it do that when it doesn't direct performance of anything? Well, and Your Honor, that's exactly what we were trying to sort out below. And okay. we well, let's to... talk about that. So you're trying to sort this out below and the court says, look, here's what you need to do. You filed a motion. It doesn't really go to a final judgment because the final judgment hasn't been entered. We're going to need to uh, get that entered. And then you can challenge the final judgment and raise whatever you want to change. And if I recall correctly, you basically say, OK. Right. I do not recall what I said at the hearing. Well, you yeah. didn't say, Judge, you're wrong. You can't do that. And here's why you can't do that. Am I right about that? Or do you not remember that either? No, I would not have stated so boldly in front of the no, court. You may not. Did you tell the court, Judge, we're here and here's why we have to go forward with a, either an evidentiary hearing or whatever we need to do? You didn't tell the judge that. You basically said, I understand what the court is saying and that's fine. And... Based on what the court was saying, my understanding and belief was that 
well, if this is not a final judgment, then there needs to be a motion to vacate the default to address the actual merits of the case, to get to the actual issues. And, and so filed, that's why you, we filed the second motion. When you filed the motion to vacate, did you file any affidavit by your client or by anyone setting out what the excusable neglect was or what the meritorious affirmative defenses would be? The affirmative defenses, my recollection is, had been filed with the answer. No, that's not what I asked you, counsel. That's not what I asked you. I asked you, did you or your client file an affidavit in connection with the motion to vacate? The affidavit, the verified motion was filed the day after. So it was not filed contemporaneous with the June 3rd motion, no. So the verified motion that you're referring to is what record page? Is that the one dated February 5th? I think you said that the verified motion was the one to disqualify Judge Kyle, which was filed the day after. It was filed the day after. Filed the motion to. The and my January. question is, when you filed the motion to vacate, I think you just said that it was verified. I don't see a verification on the motion to vacate. So did you file anything of an evidentiary nature in support of the motion to vacate? It was not. There was nothing filed in the form of an affidavit or a verified motion contemporaneous. The day after was the filing of the verified motion to disqualify, which outlines the- But the motion to disqualify was not referencing the motion to vacate. It did not support the motion to vacate. Is that correct? It was not filed contemporaneous for the sole purpose That's of- That's not what I'm asking motion. you, counsel. Was, well, I would it disagree filed, that was it filed and does it address uh, the language, the the requirements to support a motion to vacate. It did not go to the merits of a motion to vacate. However, we had requested and there has not been heard an evidentiary hearing on the motion to vacate. But isn't, it, ask you a question. isn't there a requirement that an affidavit in support of a motion to vacate alleging an excusable neglect the meritorious defenses be supported by an affidavit? All of the evidence was filed supporting at the time was filed as attachments. So there's record evidence. Was, there, was, an affidavit, was there an affidavit that established a foundation as business records or something that would allow documents that you submitted into the record somehow having an evidentiary value? No, and that would be the purpose of having the evidentiary hearing was to admit evidence in support of. Okay, so, so your position is that a defendant has no obligation to file a supporting affidavit the defendant can simply sit back and say, I want an evidentiary hearing and we'll bring a witness and we'll let you know what they're going to testify to when they testify. That's your position? The motion had been very- is that your, is that your, You're telling me you wanted an evidentiary hearing. Do you have any case support that says you do not have to file uh, a supporting affidavit? You can simply say, we'll come in on a day of an evidentiary hearing and we'll let you know what our grounds to uh, vacate and what evidence we have to vacate at that point in time. Is there any case that says that? My understanding is that, that it must be supported by evidence. I'm not aware of a case. I would have to submit a supplemental memoranda on that specific issue because I have not that for today. I think Judge LeBert, you had, you had a question. So I just, the question about the evidentiary hearing, I'm troubled by that. The, your reliance on a letter that we don't have that wasn't filed. And there's a procedure in the rules for reconstructing facts that aren't otherwise apparent on the record. And for you to say, particularly after the trial judge at the conclusion of the June hearing, where he said, I'm gonna enter the final judgment and I invite you to file a 1.540B motion and set it for an evidentiary hearing, to say to you're hanging part of your hat here on the fact that you requested an evidentiary hearing, a matter of which there is no record. And putting aside whether, when you would have to line up your evidentiary ducks and how in support of this motion, I'm troubled by that because it seems to me that if you were gonna make, if that's a piece of what you're relying on, it would have been easy enough to file the letter. Um, it would have not, I don't know how easy it would have been to get your opponent to agree to this, but it would, the procedure to avail yourself of a reconstruction of that event under the rule was available. And it doesn't appear that either of those was attempted. 
So we've got a couple of record deficiencies. The affidavit supporting or the verification of the disqualification motion isn't going to get you anywhere on the vacatur or setting aside. And the idea that you presumably would have or did ask for an evidentiary hearing but didn't get one is pretty speculative given lack of record and the fact that the judge specifically contemplated that that would be the next step and suggested it to you. Ms. Hall, uh, let me just let you know, we're into your rebuttal time. You can take 30 seconds and answer that and I'll preserve your rebuttal time. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, with regard to that, uh, looking at the record of its, in and of itself that we do have in front of us on appeal, the motions were filed and there was not an evidentiary hearing that was granted. There was not one held. So that absence of a record is what we relied upon. Um, as far as the record goes. Very good. Mr. Upson, you may proceed. And please report Keith Upson for Appellee Lisa Caviola. The argument I had prepared for this morning was exclusively limited to the absence of affidavits or sworn statements in the record as to those three, um, three elements, the excusable neglect, meritorious defense, or, or due, and due diligence. Um, in light of the argument so far, my sense is that that, would be that argument would be repetitive. I think the court appreciates the points that I was going to try and make. Uh, I've never done this. I've never seen it done. Um, I can spend my time if the court would like me to, but because my sense now is that the court already has an appreciation of the argument that I wanted to make, I don't see any sense in, in consuming the rest of my my time, unless the panel has any questions for me. Uh, I'll ask you one question, Mr. Upson. Uh, opposing counsel has made the argument that they asked for an evidentiary hearing and they were prepared to go forward at the time of an evidentiary hearing. Is an evidentiary hearing uh, something that would be done in these circumstances? I mean, you've, you've handled a lot of appeals I think you've handled appeals of these natures or of this nature in the past. Is there any mechanism by which a party who seeks to set aside a default does not have to file supporting affidavits and can basically request a hearing, an evidentiary hearing? Are you aware of any authority for that? I'm not, Your Honor, and it seems inconsistent with um, Bank of New York Mellon versus P2D2 cited in our answer brief that the party seeking to vacate the default bears the burden of establishing those three things. It, it, this court in Bank of New York said by affidavit or sworn statement setting forth the facts. Um, I, I'm not aware of, of any authority that examines whether or not those two filings are to the exclusion of in-person testimony. I, I can help you out with that. Doesn't uh, Bank of New York Mellon versus Peterson say that granting such a motion without evidence and um, evidence emphasized to support the ruling is an abuse of discretion. Going to defer if, if the your honor, if you have the full text in front of you, of course, the text of this court's decision is what it is. I I don't have the full text at my fingertips, but I don't have any reason to suspect that what you just read, your honor, is not exactly what this court found. You may proceed with uh, whatever else you wish to argue, Mr. C. I, I was simply going to invite any questions from the panel, Your Honor, and otherwise rely on the argument and authority contained in the answer brief. Hearing none, and we will turn back to Ms. Hall for her rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. With regard to the issues of the affidavits or sworn statement, looking at Bank of New York Mellon, and again, there is record evidence that supports the finding of excusable neglect. It has been filed. There was not an evidentiary hearing that was- Wait, 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 stop. Your contention is that filing emails and pleadings is the same as submitting evidentiary support? Yes, Your Honor, emails and supporting documents are evidentiary support. Now, whether or not- What they if they're, they're not paid. authenticated? That's- uh, Right, which is the next point that I was getting to, whether or not they were authenticated in the motion is not something that was done. However, hence the request for the evidentiary hearing. 
as I sit here today, I'm not aware of anything that requires that the evidence be submitted much in the same fashion as a motion for summary judgment, where it must well, be- That's what evidence. evidence generally means. I mean, you can't move for summary judgment, attach a bunch of documents and say, I'll bring my affidavit or my witness to the hearing. The idea is to have evidence that is in the record when you get to the hearing, not to be playing some game with what might the evidence become. And the, there is still, again, the affidavit that was filed, not contemporaneous with, there is contemporaneous emails and other correspondences in support of the motion. And it is not the summary judgment rule, which makes it very clear what must be done in order to have it established. And in fact, an evidentiary hearing on a motion for summary judgment is very strictly defined and that there's not going to be evidence taken or submitted. And my understanding and review of the law is that that's not the right. It's a paper hearing with authenticated evidence that's been authenticated for submission to be considered as evidence, much like a hearing in this setting would be. And I'm not aware of any authority that indicates that there is not, it would not be accepted at an evidentiary hearing to submit further evidence in support of a motion to vacate. And the issue of which has been, gone largely overlooked in the appellee's responsive brief is that counsel for Cavioli, Caviola, excuse me, affirmatively represented that he would not file a request for a final default until the issue of representation had been sorted out, which- You, you think that been, email is an affirmative representation that he won't file a motion for default? That's what, the, you, that's the what you want us to read out of that email? Yes, the request was made please hold off until I find out if I'm representing defendant Parisi. And he, for six months, the question of whether you were representing Parisi had been open and generally negative because that was the first question that was asked when the complaint was filed. So how much longer was he supposed to wait? He had requ I had requested that counsel for Parisi wait until I figure out whether I'm retained and representing and have the authority to represent Parisi on a new case with the identical issues. And the response was, will do. So attorneys have been and always have been entitled to rely on the representations of counsel, which in this case did not happen. So that is also an issue that Parisi has raised in her appeal. Before we conclude, I want to ask one question regarding the motion to disqualify. In paragraph, you set out a number of factors in the motion, and then you attach transcripts which you suggest contain these statements evincing the unfair prejudice by Judge Kyle. Was it your expectation that Judge Kyle and now this court on appeal would comb through the transcripts to find what statements you contend provide an objectively reasonable basis for disqualification? No, Your Honor, the paragraphs in the verified motion to disqualify, I believe it's paragraphs 26 and 27 indicate exactly what the allegations were and the transcript attached was highlighted with the relevant portion. So they would have been um, pages five, six, seven, and nine um, were the highlighted statements made by the trial court. The one statement that you seem to be referring to is at the end of paragraph 26, where the judge scoffed in disbelief that the defendant did not understand the service process. And that was highlighted on page nine of the attached transcript. Very good. If there are no other questions, then that concludes the time. Thank you both very much. You may exit the courtroom. The next case is Greenspire Global versus Sarasota Green Group. Very good, I see Mr. Kelly and Mr. Norton. And Mr. Kelly, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Uh, good morning, Your Honor. It's Matthew Kelly on behalf of the petitioners, uh, Greenspire Global and Steve Knaus uh, individually. And uh, Your Honors, I'd like to reserve uh, five minutes for rebuttal. Very good. Thank you. 
Uh, so just to begin, this case, the underlying case, is a case about ingredients of certain proprietary products belonging uh, to Greenspire Global. In the complaint, the second amendment complaint, uh, it alleges misrepresentation about ingredients and the organic nature of Greenspire's products, uh, allegedly licensed to the respondent SGG, Sarasota Green Group, who I'll refer to as SGG, uh, under an alleged exclusive uh, license agree agreement. Uh, the issue before this court today is whether the trial court departed from the essential requirements of the law in ordering production of Greenspire's proprietary formulas and testing of its product over many years, uh, which are trade secrets of Greenspire. But this, this, tell me, this, this all goes back to the requirements of the federal statute, correct? That is what has been alleged. So there's the federal insecticide, uh, uh, rodenticide, right. fungicide act. And, and that statute would require more than just a listing of ingredients to determine whether these are prohibited products. Is so that the, correct? So the respondent has made that assertion in, in, the, in the response. And as I say in the reply, uh, you know, we do dispute the extent of that. So, you, you know, what we would argue about FIFRA is essentially FIFRA provides a list of ingredients that are exempted uh, from certain regulations under the EPA. And if you use those ingredients, your product is exempted. Now, the issue in this case is that there were two ingredients uh, that were not exempted and therefore made the, the product violate uh, the FIFRA requirements. Uh, so we're just talking about ingredients. Um, the, the aspect of the response that claims that you have to work in your formulas and things like that, and therefore it's relevant, you know, I do want to point out that none of this was brought up in the trial court. So we did not have an opportunity to respond to that. And that really is the issue uh, here in our Are you addressing the trial court, the statutory framework that is required by FIFRA? Uh, we did not specifically address oh, doesn't, that. In, doesn't that statute, as Judge LaRose pointed out, doesn't that statute require that every pesticide registered uh, with the EPA administra administrator includes disclosure of complete formulas? Uh, yes, to, you know, for FIFRA, though, you know, the issue in this, in this case, well, is if, FIFRA, if FIFRA has it, and there is a notice issued that your product does not comply for purposes of exemption, then tell me why the other side isn't entitled to see what formulas you registered and what formulas you're using that support the contention that I guess the analysis was wrong and that you should be exempt. So the, because the, the violation notice that was issued in this case, and that was included in the supplemental appendix filed by uh, the respondent, lists the two ingredients that were allegedly identified that made it not compliant. Which, so presu which presumably your client disputes, right? Correct. So wouldn't the formula itself, rather than a list of ingredients that you contend are in the formulas, wouldn't the formulas itself be the evidence that goes to whether or not you complied with the legal requirements? Uh, well, we don't believe it does. And let me, let me explain and, why. And a confidentiality agreement was entered into by the parties and approved by the court, right? That's correct. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so so does, that that issue, does that confidentiality remind me, does it have a, like a, a council I only provision? Uh, it does. I mean, it's a, it's a confidentiality provision that, that protects the, some- They would have such a, it has such a, 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 a a, uh, a provision, right? Council it does. Yes. But it also says the parties and anybody who needs to know in the parties, yes. right? Right, that's, so that's correct. Not yes. a strict attorney's eyes only. That, that's right, I, I apologize for that. that. That's right, it is It is a bit broader than that. And, you know, because uh, that is a primary argument made by the respondent, but the confidentiality agreement was entered. Uh, it does not constitute a waiver. There are many confidential issues in this case, including the ingredients. Some of the things we've produced are how the ingredients evolved over the years. That would be a trade secret. Um, let me ask uh, you another, let me ask you a shift, gear, <laughs> shift gears on a question for you. Wasn't the trial court required to either conduct an in-camera review or have a hearing, an evidentiary hearing to determine not just whether the requested information was a trade secret, but also the reasonable necess necessity of its production? Yes, absolutely, Your Honor, and that is that is the main thrust here of our of our petition. 
Uh, the trade secret nature of the products was not in dispute. That was contended in the trial court and in the response that they are in fact trade secrets. So we kind of dispose of that in camera uh, requirement. But uh, at the hearing, uh, the party seeking disclosure was required to provide the court with or, or carry a burden to show that it was it had a reasonable necessity for the disclosure. And in this case, that simply did not happen. And you know, we could talk about the issue of FIF, run whether it's you know the formulas have to be disclosed and what has to be disclosed. But the problem is, is that we were robbed of the opportunity to address that in the trial court. None of that, none of that at all, was raised in the trial court. Not in the motion, not at the hearing, never, not at all. The first time it was raised was in the response. Okay, and that's the problem. That's why we're seeking uh, this writ. And, you know, to go back to the formula versus the ingredients issue, you know, that's the judge kind of conflates the two. And, and you know, I use an example of, of Coca-Cola. Okay, on a Coca-Cola bottle, the ingredients are on the, the label. So they're known. Everybody knows the ingredients. The formula, though, is one of the most protected trade secrets in the world. Nobody knows that except Coca-Cola. Well, well, with the evidentiary hearing question, did you ask the court or object to the failure to, con to conduct an in-camera review or an evidentiary hearing? Uh, we did not specifically request an evidentiary hearing on this issue. It was the burden uh, of the respondent to establish their reasonable necessity, uh, whether they were able to do that with argument or via uh, an evidentiary hearing, it simply did not happen. There was not even an argument made about the need for this information. Not, not a, any argument at all. Uh, in response, we argued that they had no need for this information and we attempted to argue the distinction between formulas and inspections, but that, that didn't happen. So there was a burden here that belonged with the respondents to carry and, and this court has said that that is a high burden and it simply didn't happen. You don't, you, don't, you don't dispute that the burden can be met based on the pleadings and discovery of record and an evidentiary hearing may not be required. I mean, you don't dispute that, do you? Uh, I do not, but the burden would require the court to find that the information was necessary to prove something in the case, uh, and, it's, and it's not. Now, you know, again, like your honor brought up, there is the issue of FIFRA, which was raised for the first time in the response, but we should be provided the opportunity to respond to that and to address what it is FIFRA requires. Well, there, there, was a, there was a hearing in front of the judge and you had the opportunity to argue the reasons why this information was not relevant or likely to lead to the discovery of relevant evidence, didn't you? Yes, and, and we did argue that. We argued the that. And the, judge, and the judge made a ruling. The judge decided, no, I think there's enough here. The entire lawsuit is grounded on this idea of what is in this product and basically why was there a notification issued that the product doesn't comply because it has non-exempt components. And so your client's contention is, doesn't have non-required components. Here's our list of ingredients. There's a disconnect there, right? Between what your client contends and what the notice says. And so isn't that exactly the reason why the court said, we need to see exactly what's in here. I wanna see the formulas. I wanna see the tests and so forth, or that the other side is entitled to see that. I mean, isn't that essentially what the court did based on the pleadings and the uh, documents of record? Yes, but the issue is that the pleadings don't say anything about formulas. This isn't a case about simply ingredients. And you know what we're talking about with a formula is we're talking about the amount of each ingredient, the composition uh, of the ingredients, the testing, the way it's produced. We're talking about a lot of information that has no bearing on the outcome of this case because this case is about whether or not there were ingredients that were not exempt under FIFRA. So, and, you're, so, so as, I wanna make sure I understand then your position is that as long as we list the ingredients and those ingredients do not include something that is problematic, case is over. Well, it, I mean, yes and no, because I think it's a little more nuanced than that. So, so everybody's got to take your client's word for it as to what is in the product and what the formulation is. And the reason the formulation seems to me to be significant is there might be a um, insignificant amount of a product that is not uh, exempt. 
And that may not may or may not be a problem, but the formula as to how much of that product is in there could trigger the needle to move far enough to where the FIFRA says, no, this doesn't qualify. Well, no. So actually the way FIFRA works is if a product that is not exempt is in it, it is not an exempt product in any amount. Uh, and that's what the violation notice says. It identifies specifically two products or two ingredients, excuse me, that are alleged to be in the products that are not compliant. Um, now, as to whether or not it's just about whether or not it was in there, this is a case for fraud, essentially, and that fraudulent misrepresentations they allege were made by, by my client. Which is client. what is alleged. That, that's right. That is what is alleged. So it isn't just about whether or not that's in the product. It's about uh, knowledge about whether it's not exempt. It's about when those products, or those ingredients were uh, deemed uh, not to be exempt under FIFRA. It's about some let's other issues. Assume, let's assume for the sake of argument that your client believes there was no problematic ingredient in there, then wouldn't the formula, uh, whatever it is composed of, and whoever puts that formula, formula and the product together, wouldn't that tell everybody that there is or there isn't a non-disclosed product in there. Well, the ingredients would tell that because if there's an ingredient in there and it doesn't matter the amount of the ingredient, it doesn't matter how the product was made, it doesn't matter the years of proprietary testing that my client uh, has undergone with these products, none of that is relevant to the issue that the plaintiffs are gonna seek to prove in this case, which so is whether or not. So if the proprietary testing supports the plaintiff's cause of action and your client wishes to hide it, your position is they're entitled to hide it. Well, my client is entitled under 9506 to protect its trade secrets from a competitor. I mean, we are talking about an industry competitor here. And, and what the court has done is ordered my client to hand over all of his products, all of his research, all of his testing over years of building this company to a competitor in a case where their allegations can be proven simply on whether or not there's an ingredient in, there, in, in the product that's not exempt under FIFRA, and they have that information. I mean, it's about how uh, extremely prejudicial this is to my client. I mean, this is ordering Coca-Cola uh, to provide its proprietary formula for manufacturing its product to RC Cola or any other uh, uh, cola company in the country. That's what was done here. And it was done without an opportunity to address any of these allegations about FIFRA and whether it would actually be relevant. It was done in the way exactly the, the case that I cited, uh, the Seacoast Fire case versus Triangle, which is on a whim. That's what happened in this case. Uh, the, the respondent made no arguments in the motion, made no arguments in the, at the hearing about why this information was necessary. And the court uh, in, a, in a pretty quick hearing uh, went through some of the allegations and said, well, it, it could be in some way, and we didn't have an opportunity to respond to any of that. And what essentially happened is the burden in this case was put on my client to anticipate arguments about relevancy from the respondent and then rebut that. Uh, we haven't had that opportunity. Uh, this, this should be uh, quashed, uh, and if necessary, it should have a hearing where we can address these issues that have been raised about FIFRA. Um, but there is a significant, significant distinction between ingredients and formula that we, you know, that the judge kind of conflated the two uh, and we really haven't had an opportunity to address, but it is a significant difference. And the outcome of this order is, is uh, very prejudicial and damaging uh, to my client. I mean, it, it's, it could render these things valueless and a confidentiality order is not gonna protect that. The know-how and the knowledge of how to make these products, what goes into them, how much of each ingredient you put in, when all they need to know is the ingredients that are in them. And Let's talk for a minute them. about the financial information. Your opponent says that the reason the financial information is necessary is to defend Mr. Knaus, Knaus his jurisdictional challenge. I don't, I don't know where you are on time, and you may want to address this on rebuttal, but before we go through everything having to do with the formula ingredients issues, I did want to address the financial discovery issues. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, so yeah, yeah Mr. Kelly, just said, so I'll let you know, you've got about half a minute on your original 15. So go ahead and answer the question. And if you do so uh, fairly succinctly, then you'll have your full five minutes for rebuttal. 
Thank you, and I'll, I'll do my best to do that. So uh, the issue on the financial, they're essentially requesting K-1s, W-2s, personal fi financial information my client. Uh, again, it has nothing to do with the allegations uh, of their complaint. The jurisdictional issue has been ruled on. I know an argument was made in the response that somehow those are relevant to the jurisdictional issue, which has been raised as an affirmative defense. Um, but again, we're talking about personal financial information uh, of my client and you know, we haven't really had an opportunity uh, to address that. It's not relevant to the allegations of the complaint, which pertain to an exclusive license agreement um, uh, and, and the ingredients we've, we've been discussing. I'm sorry, did you say, did you say the jurisdictional issue has been ruled upon or has not been? Well, the, yeah, I mean, the, the circuit court has determined that it has jurisdiction in this case. A personal jurisdiction? Personal jurisdiction, correct. Okay, so are you contending then that the financial information is now moot? Uh, yes, it is now moot that it's been ruled on. Um, but additionally, uh, you know, we haven't, as it's sort of with the formula and the ingredient argument, we haven't had an opportunity to respond to that because it was raised for the first time, uh, you know, in the response to our petition, uh, you know, the connection between that and personal jurisdiction. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Norton. Yes, Your Honor. May it please the court. Hunter Norton on behalf of the Appellee Sarasota Green Group, LLC. I want to first touch on what uh, Judge LeBrit initially asked, which, uh, she, which, which related back to the trial court's obligation to host an evidentiary hearing. Before, you, before you go to that, go ahead. Sure. is the financial information now moot? No, it's not. Let me explain why. There was a full day evidentiary hearing on a motion to dismiss for lack of personal jurisdiction. The defendants or the appellants here lost. The court found it did have jurisdiction. Then when they filed their answer to the second amended complaint, they nevertheless asserted it again as an affirmative defense and also asserted the corporate shield doctrine as an affirmative defense. So the affirmative, no. the affirmative defense and those issues have not been resolved on summary judgment or otherwise. Still That's there. correct. All right, go yeah. ahead then. Yeah, and that, and, and that also brings me full circle back to where I was beginning, which is the court here did have a full day evidentiary hearing to resolve that issue and determine whether or not it was more likely than not that a tort had in fact been committed if proven out in the state of Florida and specifically Manatee County. So the court was eminently familiar with all of these issues, including the FIFRA issue, all of the players, the central issues in this case, which are whether or not there was a fraudulent representation made by the defendants to my client concerning the formulas and organic properties of these products. So the court was very, very familiar. And I point but that out. Let me ask you, quick, was that hearing before the hearing that uh, we have a transcript from the hearing on the motion to compel? I don't believe we have a transcript of anything else that may have happened after the motion to compel hearing. It was, yeah, it was before the motion to compel. So okay. it, it, the court was eminently familiar. And the reason I point do, that out- Do we have it in our record though? Because I didn't see it. No, it's not in the record. I have to-, I have to So at this point, it. you really can't be arguing things that aren't in the record. You know, whether yeah, it should be in fact, the record, whether it should be in the record or not is a different issue, but it's not now. So sure. go ahead with your argument. Sure. The point being that, that the Suncoast uh, the Suncoast fire case that they're relying on here, so in the case it relies on, which is Beck Dumas, they both say the same thing. They're saying that the court doesn't need to have an evidentiary hearing on reasonable necessity if one of two things happens. Either the court's eminently familiar with the issues, which here the judge was, or two, if there's really no issue in uh, fact. And that's really critical here because I'm hearing that, well, FIFRA is raised for the first time in the response. That's not correct. FIFRA is set forth specifically in our second amended complaint. And I would direct the court to the record uh, on this. Uh, it's, it's, it's at paragraph, record 10 at paragraph 29 of our second amended complaint, where we allege specifically that these products were represented to us to be compliant with FIFRA, and they were not compliant with FIFRA. That's the whole point of this. And with respect to the, so when we get the notices telling us that they, there's two ingredients here that bring you within the auspices of FIFRA, and therefore these products are not compliant, that's when this lawsuit uh, began. We then get, as you can imagine, in a fraud case, we get responses denying the allegation that, right, they, they deny it. They don't admit that, that these products violate FIFRA, they deny it. 
Then they tell us, well, we're giving you all of the ingredients, but they don't. What they give us are just the labels to the products. The only way that we know what's actually in these products is one, knowing what they're telling us the formula is, two, whether or not that formula was actually tested, and three, the testing is also important for another critical reason here, and that is whether or not they had knowledge that these products were not FIFRA compliant. Because if, as we suspect, these products contained non-exempt ingredients and they're not FIFRA compliant, that would have been dis uh, determined through testing, right? So I would imagine, uh, you know, as in any fraud case, case I'm going to hear uh, as we go through this that I had no idea these ingredients were in there. Well, to, to prove that out, I need to see your testing results because I'm imagining at some point along the way, someone told you, hey, you have non-exempt ingredients here. You need to comply with FIFRA. That's our suspicion. And that's what we're, the reason we need these to prove that. So let, let, me, let me ask a question on that. Uh, assuming that we agree you're entitled to testing results, why are you entitled to the exact formula, uh, which has every ingredient and percentages and how you do it and so forth? Why does that, why is that reasonably necessary as opposed to whatever testing results may exist? Yeah, so Judge Silbring, you actually keyed on it earlier and I have to respectfully disagree with the council. I was concerned that what I would hear is what you asked earlier is that, well, yes, uh, there is this one non-exempt uh, ingredient in there, but it's only at 0.00001% and therefore it's not within the auspices of FIFRA. Uh, so that was my concern is that because FIFRA is going to require at least certain amounts of these ingredients that I need the full formulas to determine that. And also quite candidly, I would like to ask the FDA if this is FIFRA compliant, which requires us to go to the FDA with the formula. And not only the formula, I would also note that if you read through the entire FIFRA statute, which is extremely lengthy, they're also reserved the right to ask for all the testing results. And I imagine that the reason that's in the statutes is the same reason I want to hear whether or not they are aware of what ingredients are in their product. And, and so that the FDA has that uh, at their hands if they request it. But the formula certainly is required to be produced if, uh, to comply with FIFRA. And because it was represented that these, com that these products are exempt from FIFRA, and, and, and we determined that, no, actually, they're required to comply with FIFRA. To comply with FIFRA, we need this. I would also point out one other thing. I've heard several times that we are a competitor. And while that may now be true, remember the position of these parties when this deal was struck. We were the exclusive licensee of these products. It was our job to manufacture and sell these products for the manufacturer, for the, you know, for the defendant's benefit. That was the whole purpose of the exclusive license agreement here. So we were not prior to this, competitors, we were working together. And the fact that our, you know, someone tells us these things to get us to enter into a license agreement, which turns out to be fraudulent. And now you're telling me, I don't have to tell you what the formulas are because, you know, they're trade secret. And even though we've entered into a confidentiality agreement, you still don't get them. Well, obviously 9506 disagrees saying you can't shield your own fraud by arguing that these are trade secrets. And that's effectively what's being done. We immediately recognized that we were dealing with trade secrets. There's no dispute there. We immediately suggested and negotiated out a confidentiality agreement. It's for attorney's eyes and also experts' eyes, obviously, as may be needed to determine whether or not these uh, products are, are or are not compliant with the federal regulations, FIFRA. Uh, so it's not as though these will be handed down to our client to use and manufacture. And even Judge Nicholas noted that at the hearing and it's in the transcript where he said, I would come down very, very hard on that. I don't expect that would happen here, but I would come down very hard on it. But Judge Nicholas in making his ruling noted that this issue, the, the ingredients and the testing and the knowledge that that was his words were, it's the heart of the case. It's the ultimate question. That's in quotes, that was his words. It's the ultimate question in the case. And that's because not only from his knowledge of, of everything that's gone on in this case, but it's, it's in the pleadings itself that these ingredients were mislabeled to intentionally omit these uh, ingredients. 
that the ingredients brought the products within the auspices of FIFRA and that they were intentionally misrepresented to us both through oral statements and in the exclusive license agreement itself. So uh, let, me, let me turn to uh, the financial information. Sure. You have alleged, your client has alleged fraud, which is an independent basis for jurisdiction in Florida, correct? Correct. Under law. So, yes. So because you have jurisdiction based on the allegations of the complaint, what is the purpose, what is the relevancy, uh, and what is the necessity for the financial information relating to Mr. Canals? Sure. I mean, so he, Mr. he purportedly committed a fraud in Florida. The case law and the statute give you jurisdiction or the court jurisdiction over him in Florida. So what's the purpose of the financial information? And how is that, well, there are really two parts to this question. How was that established to the court? And two, it doesn't look like the court addressed it in any way at the hearing. There was no discussion at the hearing about financial information. So I have to say, candidly, I'm concerned about that. And I want to hear uh, the basis to go forward to allow that discovery to, uh, to take place. Sure. And I appreciate the question. And you're correct. Uh, neither, neither party, notably the appellant here, did not raise that specific issue. And it, well, was, it was a motion to compel. He had raised the objection. So, okay. you know, it's teed up and nobody, nobody talks about it to the court. Right. I think other than a generic statement that in our, in our motion to compel, that they were relevant to the pleadings and claims and defenses of the parties. And in that, that sort of does tells us into the first part of your question, which was, how is it relevant now? Well, I would tend, based on counsel's concession, that the personal jurisdiction defense is now moot, then certainly that is off the table. But what remains on the table is the corporate shield defense, where what you have Canals telling us is that I was only there in a representative capacity of Sarasota Green Group, even though he was the only person there for Sarasota Green Group. It was strictly as a corporate capacity. If we are able to show... Through the And I don't know that we'll be able to. Uh, that's the reason we're doing this in the context of discovery. If we're able to show, however, that Mr. Knauss derived an independent financial gain as it relates to his misrepresentations or fraudulent conduct in Florida, then that corporate shield defense would go by the wayside. Uh, and we cited- wouldn't, wouldn't the corporate shield defense go by the wayside if there's fraud? Yeah, well, but remember, there's cases, and we cited the Freehop case, among others, in our response, where it, it, it was, in that instance, it was a corporate officer who was traveling to Florida, strictly to, in their corporate capacity, derive no independent benefit from the fraud committed by the corporate entity there, and the court said, based on that, there is no, it was a jurisdictional question, but still, there is no jurisdictional question because the corporate shield would shield the officer acting in that capacity. However, well, was the officer in that case, the officer who made the purported misrepresentations? No, was not. And so isn't that a distinction in this case where you have alleged Mr. Canals himself made those fraudulent statements on which your client relied? Yeah, it is a distinction. It's certainly one of the numerous factors that we would like to argue, but it also should be supported by not only was he making it, he was making it so that he could derive his own financial gain, uh, independent or as part and parcel with the company. But um, again, I, again, I have to press the point. How is that relevant if he is the officer making the purported fraudulent statements? He, I, if I remember the discovery, he admits he is what president and he's got an ownership interest in the company. Uh, and and I, I, I'm not gonna swear to that, but I thought that was part of the discovery that you already have, uh, that he admitted those roles. So if he's admitted those roles, if he's the guy on the scene who makes the misrepresentations, uh, what more do you need for purposes of financial discovery? Well, I would certainly tend to agree that that would go a long way towards defeating that defense. But I don't know, you know, since they're continuing to maintain this defense uh, and they're continuing to make these assertions that he's protected, I, you know, I owe, I have an obligation to my client to explore all avenues and certainly whether or not he had and exactly what his financial arrangement is uh, with Sarasota Green Group, that I don't know. I do know that he's at least a corporate officer. I do not know if he also serves as an employee or takes a salary. I don't know that. Uh, I don't know whether or not he receives some sort of independent, as I've said before, a financial benefit out of this transaction. I just don't know. 
Um, again, this is discovery in a fraud case, which as we cited in our um, response is certainly broader than typical discovery. This isn't something that I'm looking to go into just so that I can have a way of executing ultimately. In fact, it's protected also by the confidentiality agreement. Uh, so the purpose here is to at least explore, you know, since they've raised this now as their affirmative defense, I think I'm entitled to at least discover any responses I might have in that respect. And that would include his financial dealings with Sarasota Green Group only for those years, only for those years where he was uh, in place, uh, you know, and in Florida and as restricted by um, the pleadings and, and the request. So your view is that his acknowledgement and his, his testimony and his affidavit that he is president and that he met uh, as president of Greenspire with Mr. Cassidy and others, that's not enough to, assuming you can prove that what he said was fraudulent, you don't believe that's enough to defeat the corporate shield doctrine? Oh, no, I think it is. I, I, I agree. I just don't know, you know, but I could defeat an argument for 10 reasons. I just don't want to restrict myself to nine of 10. That's, I guess the easiest way to put it. Very good. And you've got about five minutes left. Okay. Uh, at this point, the only, uh, the only um, other issue that I, I was actually going to dovetail into the financials here, but the only other thing that I would note for the court is, again, um, I want to dispel the notion that, you know, this was originally argued to the court as I understood the defendant or the appellant's argument as a sort of cat out of the bag um, defense. And we heard that again today with the analogy to Coca-Cola, which I would note that Coca-Cola is not, you know, bound to comply with the obligations of FIFRA. And that's what makes this different here. Um, so this was originally positioned as sort of a cat out of the bag. The court and Judge Nicholas uh, ruled that, no, it goes to the ultimate question in the case. Discovery in a fraud case is certainly broader. It would include these things, again, not just, you know, so that we understand whether or not it complies with FIFRA, although that is a significant portion of it, but also to establish knowledge uh, uh, on the part of the defendants that these products were not compliant uh, and they were required to be compliant. What actions they thereafter took, you know, that would spin into that, right? I find out that they were aware that, of through testing results that these were uh, non-compliant, uh, you know, uh, products that they needed to comply. I find out then that as a result of those testing results, they intentionally sent to manufacturers on labels, uh, incorrect labeling, which again, is in our pleading, it's right, it's in it's in our second amendment completing that they intentionally mislabeled their products and in doing so also misled us to enter into the license agreement. So again, because fraud is a different species, it certainly gives us an exemption under 9506 for trade secrets. You can't hide behind your trade secret privilege to conceal your own fraud, which is what's being attempted to be done here. Also, the scope of discovery is much greater. So for those reasons, unless the panel has more questions for me, I would rely on our brief and ask the court to deny the petition. Very good, thank you very much. Mr. Kelly, you have your rebuttal time. Thank you, your honors. Um, so the, the uh, well, real quick on the financial uh, information, uh, we're not talking about a discovery request that's asking what is your relationship with, with Greenspire. Uh, we're talking about a discovery request that says any and all K-1 and or W-2 schedules that were received by you from Greenspire Global for calendar years 2017, 18, 19, and 20. Um, so it's, it's quite a bit more uh, than what was being argued. Uh, they already know his relationship with Greenspire. They already know uh, who, who the other owners of Greenspire may be. That information's all known. But I want to turn to uh, the, the pressing issue of these uh, trade secrets. Um, the FIFRA argument that you heard here uh, today is not in the complaint. The complaint only talks about ingredients. Okay, what's happening here, and again, I stress that this is the first time in the response and in today's argument, is that the formulas are being bootstrapped into the FIFRA argument. The FIFRA, the way it's pled in the complaint is about the ingredients, because if an ingredient is not compliant with FIFRA, the product is not compliant with FIFRA. They know the ingredients. We've answered requests for, uh, discovery requests about the ingredients uh, going back several years, whether there's any ingredients that are not listed on the label, We've produced and, and provided all that information. Now we're going a step further and we're talking about formulas. And there is a very significant distinction between those two things that uh, I believe that the trial court you know, failed to recognize. Um, we didn't have an opportunity to respond to these FIFRA arguments. 
uh, in that setting, in an evidentiary setting, if, one, if the trial court thought one would be required. Uh, none of these arguments were, were made uh, by the respondent. The word formulas uh, did not come up in the motion. It did not come up at the hearing by respondent. Uh, we were the first ones to raise the issue of the formulas when that is exactly what the discovery requests are seeking. So how can it be said that the respondent carried a burden that this court has called a high burden when they didn't even mention why they needed this information, meaning the formulas, not even mentioned. And so of course we didn't have an opportunity to respond to it. Um, you know, the, it is a cat out of the bag uh, issue. Uh, this yeah, court, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about something. something. You know, you said you didn't have a chance to respond to it. There was a there was a request for discovery. There was a response to it and an objection. And then there was a hearing. So are you telling me that you didn't argue in defense of the objections that they're not entitled to the formula for X reasons? Yes, what we didn't get to respond to was this specific new argument about why the formulas are needed because of the FIFRA allegations of the complaint. We did not get an opportunity to respond to that. And we, we dispute that. It's, the formulas are not needed to establish their claim. I, and, I, 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 understand, I understand what your argument is. I just wanted to make sure that, in fact, you had the opportunity to tell the trial court judge exactly that. Well, well we had the opportunity to, to argue our, our objections. We didn't have the opportunity to respond to an argument that was not made by the respondent about reasonable necessity. They're arguing here- I understand, I understand your argument. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so this is cat out of the bag material. It's, it's trade secrets. It's protected by the statute. Uh, this court has ruled that it's appropriate for certiorari review. The essential requirements of the law in this case required the court to have the respondents maintain a high burden of establishing their reasonable necessity for this information. That simply did not happen. Uh, the, the hearing was rather quick. It was cut short. Uh, and it was ordered because the judge felt that it may possibly relate to issues uh, in the complaint. Uh, but it doesn't. It's, it's significantly distinct from the ingredient issue. Uh, this is very damaging to my client. They're essentially handing over their company to a competitor. Uh, the alleged exclusive license agreement that was referenced by respondent never provided them this information. It was not something that was ever contemplated, even in the uh, alleged agreement they were going to have. They were not going to be entitled to this information that they're seeking now. Uh, and if they get it, uh, they've got years and years of proprietary work that my client did to develop these products, and they simply don't need it to establish their case that these products contained ingredients that were not uh, appropriate under FIFRA. And that's exactly what the violation notice says. It doesn't say anything about the formula. It identifies two ingredients that they claim uh, were not compliant with FIFRA. Uh, so unless your honors have any other questions, I'll uh, rest on the briefs. Very good. Thank you both very much. That concludes the oral argument. All of a sudden, I'm getting feedback. Uh, that concludes the oral argument session uh, for today. Again, thank you very much. And we are adjourned. Thank you, your honors. Thank you, your honors.